Hello. Happy Sunday. Good morning. Sunday morning. <laughs> it's not the morning. But um, let's see if I can turn this around. So I can get a little bit of better better light in here. Maybe. Maybe not. No. Okay, whatever. Um, all right, so we're back to Heidi. Um, I have now activated my um, YouTube channel. And I've been downloading all of the chapters. So, um, yeah. So I'll post a link for that. So if you do join and you're like, what's going on? And you'd like to hear me read a storybook. I'm reading Heidi, one of my childhood favorite, favorite books. And I've read it from chapter one and I read two chapters at a time. Excuse me. I'm always drinking lots of water before I do this and then I'm burping. <laughs> Sorry. Um... So today we are, so yeah, go ahead and look on my YouTube channel. Um, I'll try and post a link for it permanently in my bio. So if you look under my name, excuse me, um, I think I currently have my address because people were asking me for my address to send Christmas cards, I guess. Um, so I'll try and maybe change that to my YouTube channel. Okay, so we're just going to get on into it and we're going to go into chapter nine. Uh, and if you hear some wild, crazy uh, noises going on, it's super windy here. Super windy. So, yeah, that's what all the noises are if you hear uh, smashing and crashing and wildness. The wind the wind is at crazy, crazy uh, speeds. Okay, so as I said, we're going to get into Chapter 9 from the beautiful little book, Heidi. A f oh, yeah, what had been happening? They had this basket of kittens. That's right, it was all... Okay. <laughs> a few days later, there was great excitement in the house because Herr Sussman had returned. So that's the dad. Okay. Sebastian and Tanette were kept busy carrying up parcels and suitcases from the carriage. They were packed with all sorts of exciting presents, which Clara's father was in the habit of bringing back from his travels. It was late afternoon when Herr Sussman arrived, and he came straight into the study where Clara and Heidi were sitting together. Father and daughter greeted each other with such a, sorry, each other affectionately. Then Herr Sussman held out his hand to Heidi and said kindly, And this is our little Swiss girl? Come and shake hands with me. That's right. Now, Clara, you must allow me to go and have something to eat. I have not, I've had nothing since breakfast. Later I shall see you again and show you all the things I have brought home. In the dining room, he found Fräulein Rottenmeier inspecting the table which was laid for dinner. Herr Sussman put down, sat down, and Fräulein Rottenmeier looked the picture of gloom, took the place opposite. "'What is the matter, Fräulein Rottenmeier?' asked Herr Sussman. "'You look very dismal. Have you had a stroke of bad luck? Clara seems cheerful enough. What is wrong?' With a long face, the lady began. Herr Sussman, we've have, we have been completely deceived, and it concerns Clara. In what way? Herr Sussman asked calmly. You know that we decided that Clara should have a companion, and as I knew you were anxious to have nicely a nicely brought up girl, I thought of a little Swiss girl, of whom I heard a great deal. But I have been terribly cheated, completely taken in, really shockingly. But what is so shocking? I see nothing shocking in the child, re remarked Herr Sussman, still completely unperturbed. Oh, if you only knew the type of people and the animals this creature has brought into your house, house, the tutor can tell you all about it. Animals? What am I to understand from that, Fräulein Rottmeier? Herr Sussman, it is beyond my understanding. Her whole behavior would be beyond comprehension were it not for one thing. She has spells of mental disturbance concluded Fräulein Rottmeier with conviction. Up till now, Herr Sussman had not thought of the affair of any great importance, but mental disturbance. That could very easily have a harmful effect on his little daughter. He looked quickly at Fräulein Rottmeier as though to assure himself that it was not she who was the victim of a troubled mind. Just then, the door opened and the tutor entered. Ah. Sorry, my cat is speaking in the language of his people. <laughs> um, ah, there is our tutor. Perhaps he can clear the matter up for us, Herr Sussman exclaimed. Come sit down and have a cup of coffee with us. 
he said, addressing the tutor. No need for ceremony. Now tell me what is wrong with this child who has become a companion to my daughter. What's this about her bringing animals into the house and about her mental faculties? The tutor began in his usual roundabout way. Since you asked me for my opinions about this young girl, Herr Sussman, I should like to direct your attention to the fact that, although there may be a lack of development caused by more or less neglection of education, or rather by somewhat delayed tu tuition, on the one hand, there is, and then on the other, I think we must admit a certain benefit to be gained from such a solitary life in the mountains, and we must consider... My dear friend, interrupted Herr Sessman, you take too much trouble. Tell me, did her bringing animals into the house alarm you? And what is your opinion of her as a companion for my little daughter? I have no wish to say anything against the young girl, Tudor began again. If on the one hand there is a certain inexperience of social custom, owing to the somewhat uncivilized life she has led up to the time she came to Frankfurt, on the other hand she has gifts not to be overlooked, and if carefully led, my dear sir, you must please excuse me now, I must speak to my daughter. And with these words, Herr Sessman quickly left the room. In the study, he sat down beside his little girl and turned to Heidi and said, Listen, little one, you will go and fetch me, um, fetch me. Herr Sessman wanted the child out of the room, but was having a difficult, having difficulty in thinking up an excuse. Fetch me a glass of water. Heidi disappeared at once. And now, my dear Clara, said Herr Sessman, pulling his chair closer and taking his daughter's hand, tell me quite frankly, what kind of animals did your little friend bring into the house? And what makes Fräulein Rottmeier think she is sometimes not quite right in her mind? Clara had no difficulty in explaining. She told her father the story of the tortoise and the kittens and explained all the remarks which Fräulein Rottmeier had thought so odd and which seemed to upset her so much. Herr Sessman laughed heartily. Well, then, you don't want me to send that child home, Clara? You are not tired of her? asked her father. No, no, Papa, please don't, exclaimed Clara in alarm. The time has passed so quickly since Heidi came. Something happens every day, and it used to be so dull, and she always has so much to tell me. Very well, then. Ah, here is our little friend. Have you brought me a nice fresh water? Excuse me, Herr Sussman asked. It is the, <coughs> excuse me, speaking of water, I think I need to have a sip. <coughs> yes, it is fresh from the pump, answered Heidi. <coughs> excuse me. Did you go yourself to the pump, Heidi? asked Clara. Yes, I did, but I had to go a long way because at the first pump, pump there were ever so many people and at the second there were just as many. Then I went into another street and got the water there. <laughs> the gentleman with the white hair sends his kind regards, Herr Sussman. Well, that was a long expedition, laughed Herr Sussman. And who is this gentleman? As he was passing the pump, he stopped and said, Since you have got a glass, would you mind giving me a drink? <laughs> to whom are you taking the glass of water? And I said, to Herr Sussman. He laughed and gave me the message for you, and he hoped Herr Sussman would enjoy the water. And what did this gentleman look like who sends me so many good wishes, says Herr Sussman? He wore a thick gold chain with a big red stone hanging from it, and on the top of his stick was a horse's head. That's our old friend the doctor, cried Clara, and her father at the same instant. Herr Sussman smiled to himself as he wondered what their friend would think of their new way in which the Sussmans went about quenching their thirst. That very evening, he told Fräulein Rottmeier that Heidi would remain, that he found the child perfectly normal, and that his daughter preferred her company to any other. I am anxious, therefore, said Herr Sessman emphatically, that this child should always be treated in a friendly way, and that her little peculiarities should not be treated as crimes. And by the way, if you find difficulty in managing the child, there is a prospect that you will be relieved of this duty. Mm -mm. Right on. <laughs> I am expecting my mother very soon for a long visit, and as you know, she gets along with everybody, Fräulein Rottmeier, he concluded pointedly. Yes, I know, Herr Sessman, said Fräulein Rottmeier rather sourly. Herr Sessman remained only a short time at home, and after a fortnight he set off for Paris, 
comforting his little daughter with the prospects of the arrival of her grandmother in a day or two. On the day after Herr Sessman depart Herr Sessman's departure, a letter came announcing Fra Sessman's arrival on the following day. Clara was overjoyed and talked so much about her grandmother that Heidi too called her grandmama. Fräulein Rottmeier gave her a disapproving look, which did not impress Heidi very much, since the lady was always finding fault with her in any case. Later, when Heidi was going to her bedroom, Fräulein Rottmeier took into her own room took her into her own room and instructed her that she should never address Ross Sessman as Grandmama, but always as Madame. Do you understand? she asked. Heidi did not understand at all why she could call the la why she could call the lady by this title. But Fräulein Rottmeier's face wore such a severe expression as she spoke that Heidi did not dare to ask for an explanation. I think that Fräulein Rottmeier just needs to go. <laughs> Okay, so now we're on to our second chapter of the day, which is chapter 10. The following evening, great preparations were afoot at the Sessman house. Whew, crazy wind. And presently there was the sound of a carriage stopping at the front door. Sebastian and Tanette rushed downstairs, and Fräulein Rottenmeier followed, but slowly and with dignity. She knew that she would have to be there to welcome Fra Sessman. Or Frau, I don't know. Frau. Um, Heidi, who had been ordered to wait in her room until she was called, sat in a corner and repeated over and over to her, again to herself, the little speech which she had been instructed to address Frau Sessman. Before very long, uh, Tanette came to call her. Putting her head round the corner, she announced in her usual saucy manner, You are to go into the study. Heidi made her way to the study, still turning the words over in her mind and still hardly able to believe that she should address anyone in the peculiar way Fräulein Rottmeier had told her. As she opened the door, the grandmother said in a kind voice, Ah, there is the child. Come here and let me look at you. Heidi approached and said very distinctly in her clear voice, Excuse me. Good evening, madame. Well, said the grandmother laughing, is that how you address people on the elm? No, at home... Nobody has a name like that, said Heidi gravely. Well, neither do they here, said the grandmother, still smiling and patting Heidi's cheek. When I am with children, I am always grandmama. Can you remember that? Yes, very well, Heidi assured her, because that's what I used to say. I understand, said the grandmother, shaking her head a little. She looked more closely at Heidi, and Heidi's steady, serious eyes looked back at her eagerly. For there was a warmth about the old woman, which attracted the child. Heidi gazed entranced at the beautiful white hair, which was adorned with a lacy frill, ending in two broad rib ribbons, which floated gently about grandmother's head, as though blown by a soft breeze. And what is your name, child? It is really Heidi, but if you call me Adelheid, I shall try to remember. Heidi stopped guiltily, remembering that sometimes she failed to answer when Fr Fräulein Rottmeier called her by this name. Just at that, Fräulein Rottmeier entered. Frau Sessman will agree that I had to choose a name, one which could be pronounced, and of course, on account of the servants. Very correct. I have no doubt, Rottmeier, replied Frau Sessman. But if the child is called Heidi and is accustomed to that name, I shall call her by it. So that's settled. Fräulein Rottmeier found it very embarrassing to be called by her surname. But since the grandmother would have her own way, there was nothing she could do about it. She was a very alert old lady and had all her wits about her. And she very soon knew exactly what was going on in the house. The following afternoon, after sitting by Clara's bed until she fell asleep, Frau Sessman went upstairs and knocked at Fräulein Rottmeier's door. Fräulein Rottmeier looked startled at this unexpected visit. Where is the Heidi child and what is she doing? I should like to know, said Fra Sessman, coming straight to the point. She is in her room where she could find something useful to do if she had the slightest inclination, replied Fräulein Rottmeier. But if Frau Sessman only knew the queer things she imagines and does, I can hardly bring myself to talk of them. And so would I, if I were in her place, I don't doubt. Tell the little one to come to my room. 
I have some nice books to give her. But that's just it, replied Fräulein Rottmeier, throwing up her hands in despair. Of what use are books to her? She doesn't even know the alphabet yet. It is quite impossible to teach her anything. The tutor will tell you so himself. If he didn't have the patience of a saint, he would have given up trying to teach her long ago. Well, that is strange. The child, the child does not strike me as being stupid, said Fra Sessman shortly. Now go and fetch her. She can look the pictures at the pictures for the time being. Fräulein Rottmeier was about to say more, but Fra Sessman turned and went quickly into her room. Heidi was greatly delighted with the beautiful colored pictures in the book, which the grandmother had brought. Suddenly she cried aloud as the grandmother turned a page, and when the old lady looked at the child, she saw that tears were streaming down her cheeks. She looked at once at the picture. Oh, it depicted a beautiful green pasture with all sorts of animals grazing. In the midst, the shepherd leaned against his stick and looked happily at his flock. Everything was bathed in golden light, for the sun was just setting in the far horizon. The grandmother took Heidi's hand gently. Come, come, child, don't cry. It has reminded you of something, perhaps? But look, there is a beautiful story about it, and I'm going to tell it to you tonight. There are many beautiful stories in this book, which can be read over and over again. Come now, we must have a chat. So dry your tears and stand in front of me so that I can look at you. That's right, now we are happy again. Heidi tried very hard to stop sobbing, and when at last she succeeded, the grandmother said, Now I want to tell you, I want you to tell me something, child. How are you getting on with your lessons? Do you like them? Are you well? Are you doing well? Oh no, answered Heidi with a sigh, but I knew it would be impossible. What is impossible, Heidi? To learn to read. It's too difficult. Well, I never. Who told you this? Peter did, and he knows, for he has tried, but he can't learn. It's too difficult. Well, what a boy Peter must be, but listen to me, Heidi. We must never believe that the Peters, what the Peters say, but try for ourselves. I am sure you never paid attention to the tutor or looked properly at the letters. It is no use, said Heidi with a great sigh of resignation. Now, Heidi, listen to what I say. You have not been able to read because you believed what Peter said. Now you must believe what I say when I tell you that you can learn to read like many other children who are like you and not like Peter in a very short time. First, you must know what happens when you are able to read. Do you see the shepherd on the beautiful green pasture? Well, as soon as you can read, you shall have the book for your own, and then you will know the whole story just as if someone were to tell it to you. What the shepherd did with his sheep and goats and the wonderful things that happened to him? Would you like to know all of that, Heidi? Heidi had been listening with keen attention and now exclaimed with sparkling eyes, Oh, if only I could read already. You will learn in no time. I can see that, Heidi. But now we must go to Clara. Come, we will take the books with us. The grandmother took Heidi's hand and they went together into the study. From the day Heidi had tried to go home, Excuse me. And Fräulein Rottmeier had scolded her for being so wicked and ungrateful. A change had come over the child. She knew now that she could not go home whenever she liked, as Aunt Dee had told her. But she had to stay in Frankfurt for a long time, maybe forever. She also understood that Herr Sussman would think her ungrateful, and Clara and the grandmother too, if she again showed, showed signs of wanting to leave. So there was nobody to whom she could reveal how homesick, homesick she was, for she could not face giving the grandmother, who was so kind to her, cause to be angry, as Fräulein Rottmeier had been. But the strain of keeping it all to herself became almost more than she could bear. She lost her appetite, and every day grew paler and paler. At night she would lie awake for a long time, for as soon as she was alone with everything quiet around her, she would see again in her thoughts the elm, and the sunshine and the flowers. When at last she fell asleep, she would see in her dreams the red summit, summits of the crags and the crimson snowfield in the evening sun. Awaken in the awakening in the morning, she wanted to run happily out into the sun, but she soon realized she was in the big bed in Frankfurt, far, far away from home. Then Heidi would weep long and quietly, 
her little head pressed into the pillow so that no one could hear. Heidi's unhappiness did not escape the grandmother. She waited a few days to see if there might be a change. But as Heidi remained subdued, and when she noticed that often in the early morning the child looked as though she had been crying, the grandmother took her one day into her room and said lovingly, Now tell me, Heidi, what is the matter? Are you worrying about something? But not for the world would Heidi show in gratitude to the grandmother, who had been so kind, so she replied, Please, I cannot tell you. Can you tell Clara then? Oh no, nobody, said Heidi, looking so pitiful that the grandmother was filled with compassion. Come here, little one, and I will tell you something. If one is in trouble and cannot speak about it to anyone, then one tells it to God who is in heaven, and prays to him for help, because he is able to take away all our troubles. Do you know that? Do you pray every night to your heavenly Father and thank him for all he has done for you, and ask him to keep you from harm? Oh no, I never do that, answered Heidi. Have you never prayed, Heidi? Don't you know what it is? Sometimes I used to pray with the first grandmother, but it is a long time ago, and I've forgotten it. You see, Heidi, because you have nobody to help you, you are unhappy. Think how wonderful it is when our hearts are heavy with sadness to be able to go at any moment to God and tell him everything and ask him for help when no one else can give it. He is always able to help and can give us what makes us happy again. A gleam of joy came into Heidi's eyes. May I tell him everything? Everything, Heidi, everything. Heidi drew away the hand which the grandmother held affectionately and said hastily, and asked hastily, May I go? Certainly, certainly, answered the grandmother, and Heidi ran off to her room. She sat down on her little stool, folded her hands, and told God about everything Excuse me, that made her so unhappy, and begged him with all her heart to let her go home to be with the grandfather. A little more than a week after this, the tutor asked to see Frau Sesme, as he had something very remarkable to tell her. When he was shown into her room, Frau Sesme held out her hand. I am pleased to see you. Sit down, won't you? Now tell me why you wish to see me. I hope it is not a complaint. On the contrary, madame, the tutor began. Something has occurred, something which I did not expect. In the light of all my previous experience, it was an impossibility, and yet it really has happened. It's like a miracle, contrary to all I had expected. Am I to understand that the child Heidi has learned to read after all? Frost Esmond guessed. Speechless with surprise, the tutor looked at her. It is indeed nothing short of a miracle. In spite of my painstaking explanations, oh, she never seemed able to learn the alphabet, and now she has learned it with such rapidity overnight, so to say, and so correctly it is most unusual with a beginner. Life is full of miracles, Frost Essman smiled. Of course there might be such a happy coincidence as fresh zeal for learning and a new method of teaching. Now we must be glad the child has made such a good beginning and hope for future progress. Sorry, I have cat hair on my nose ring, I think. <laughs> After she had seen the tutor to the door, she went straight to the study to make sure of the good news. Sure enough, Heidi was seated beside Clara and was reading a story to her with great eagerness. Evidently surprised herself to find the black letters turning into real people and exciting, exciting adventures. That same evening at the dinner table, Heidi found by her plate the big book with the lovely pictures, and when she looked questioningly at the grandmother, the old lady nodded her confirmation. Yes, it is yours now. Always? Even when I go home? asked Heidi, flushed with happiness. Of course, forever, assured the grandmother. Tomorrow we shall start to read it. But you're not going home yet, Heidi, Clary put it, Clara put in. Not for many years. I want you to stay with me, especially when grandmother goes away. Before she went to bed, Heidi looked at her book. And from that day on, her greatest pleasure was to read over and over again the stories which belonged to the beautiful pictures. When in the evening the grandmother said, Now Heidi will read to us. The child was delighted, and when she read aloud, the stories seemed to still be more beautiful and interesting. The picture she liked best was the one with the green pasture and the shepherd leaning happily on his crook. He was tending to his father's fine flock. 
but the next picture showed how the shepherd had run away from home and had to look after a herd of swine. He had grown quite thin, for all he had to eat was husks. In the picture, the sun did not shine so golden, and the land was grey and misty. But then there was still another picture to this story. In it, the old father was running with outstretched arms to meet his returning and repentant son, welcoming him as he approached timidly, tired and dirty and dressed in rags. This was Heidi's favourite story, which she read again and again, without ever tiring of hearing the grandmother's explanation of the meaning of the story. There were many, many other beautiful tales in the book, and with reading and studying the pictures, the days passed quickly, and the time came for grandmother's departure. And that's our two chapters for today. Sorry, my nose is getting all itchy. Sometimes I was, I was snuggling my kitty earlier and get little cat hairs in there. So yeah, we're a little bit more than halfway done the book. And I hope you guys are having a wonderful weekend. It is windy here, but it's about plus three degrees Celsius. So I am going to go outside and start working on a project. So thank you for joining me for story time. I have got to get to some building. Talk to you soon.